Now, over the weekend, uh, Planet Shakers, uh, due to the vision of Russell Evans of Planet Shakers from Melbourne, Australia, they uh, pl- the Planet Shakers team boarded airplanes and flew from Australia to San Diego, California, to the Rock Church in San Diego, California, and held their first ever United States Planet Shakers conference. And uh, what did we hear from Russell Evans? <laughs> Well, to, as to be expected, because of his past, um, um, well, poor performance uh, in handling God's Word, we heard a lot of Bible twisting and some things that were, well, rather disturbing. That's just the best way I can put it. And so what I've done here is I've uh, gone through the audio from uh, Friday night's Planet Shakers conference and have put together some little bits and pieces that I think will help explain what exactly went wrong there with the uh, with Russell Evans and the Planet Shaker folks. And you're going to find that he sounds like, Russell Evans really sounds like a kind of a combination of a vision-casting, uh, seeker-driven megachurch pastor crossed with the Patricia King gang mixed with a little bit of tele-evangelist. I mean, very eclectic. That's probably the best way to put it. And uh, so what I, we're going to start with a couple of different sound bites. But first, I, I don't know who the MC was who introduced Russell Evans, but I want to kind of give you a flavor for what happened uh, during the conference. Each and every you know night or day that they had it, they it started with praise and worship, them singing songs from their Limitless album, and they were pushing for people to buy that album like you wouldn't believe, but... The MC, you know, there's like a pattern, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, to what they do. And that is, is the praise and worship first, then the MC comes out, and he starts to set the expectation and the tone that God's going to show up. And so our first soundbite is uh, from the Master of Ceremonies from uh, Planet Shakers, who eventually will introduce... Um, Russell Evans, and I just want you to hear the way the manipulation started pretty early on on Friday night, but listen to this. Come on, Jesus is in the house! I I hope we didn't blow your eardrums out with that. Yes, Jesus is in the house! There's something that is just starting to happen in this place right now. Whether you're in this auditorium or you're online tonight, you can expect God is about to do something in here, in your room, in your church building, wherever you might be. Oh, so good to see you! All right, so expectation number one after a little bit of uh, redundant well, here's kind of how it works you know, the praise and worship time uh, the, you'll notice the songs from the limitless album if you want to listen to it you just go to itunes and download it you have to pay the fee for it though but you'll notice that these are the standard 711 praise songs it's seven words repeated 11 times or maybe 50 times and the redundancy sounds more like you know the type of thing that's used to get you into an ecstatic worship experience. And what I mean by that is ecstasis is the uh, Greek word, you know, literally two words put together to stand outside of oneself. And you got to understand this: ecstatic worship is not Christian worship. Okay, and what it basic what these these Seven Eleven songs do is beat your brain into a pulp. And as uh, recent studies have shown that, you know, in these types of environments, the, you know, the brain releases, you know, chemicals and, you know, you know, certain, you know, homemade pharmaceuticals into the body to create some kind of a feeling of an ecstatic experience. But it's not the Holy Spirit that's at work. And so after a little bit of that has gone on, the MC comes out and says, Oh, God is about to do something. You need to expect that. So set the expectations. So, you know, then they launch into another set of these 7-Eleven redundant bash your brain with bricks until it's a mushy pulp uh, kind of songs. And and then he comes out again and to set the expectation again. He, so here's kind of the second version of his or second attempt at the, the MC setting expectation uh, here at uh, the Shift Conference, not the Shift Conference, the Planet Shakers Conference. Here we go. Who's had a great day so far? Online, I don't know what sort of day you've had so far today, but we're believing that tonight you're going to move from whatever circumstance you might have been in into the presence of God in this place. So we're, we, we're, we we believe you're going to move from whatever circumstance you might to the presence of God, okay? So they're believing for 
and having expectations. So I want you to have expectation in your heart. Believe that tonight God's going to shift something. He's already begun in people during the course of today. But whether you've been here for the last 24 hours or you just arrived online or in the room, we're just believing that God is going to do something profound in your life. So if you've got expectation in your heart, why don't you now just prepare yourself to join with Pastor Sam as the team as we worship God. Come on. All right. So their second attempt at setting the expectation. We're be- My question is, um, why does God have to use guys like this who twist the Bibles in order to have something shift in people's lives? You see, it all just feels like slick manipulation, emotional manipulation to me. So then they launch into more of this, you know, worship. In fact, you know, 30 more minutes of it, you know, what, you know, where again, seven eleven songs, you know, seven words repeated over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And now after 30 more minutes of this, your brain is pretty much non-functional um, as far as any ability to think cognitively, to listen with discernment or anything like that, because you're caught up in the so-called experience of the moment. And something no- noteworthy here is that they really geared the uh, the weekend conference for to you know towards young people. So this is kind of you know again something akin to like the passion conference without nearly the uh, the production value. But he- so here's you know kind of the last intro, you know, the last set of uh, setting expectations by this MC. From uh, Planet Shakers, uh, here and listen in. Jesus is in the house. Yeah, we got Jesus. He's in the back. He might pop his head out and wave at you or something. I, I don't know what. Ah, we're going to ask you right now, just to, if you could, if you're in the auditorium, just start to head back to your seats. If you're online right now, now's not the time to leave. Stay with us. We're, we're going to have an incredible few moments. As we hear from our pastor, Pastor Russell Evans, shortly. But if you could just head yeah, back. Yeah, so Jesus is in the house, so they're kind of calming people down now. And I'm going to, again, fast forward a little bit here. And I want you to hear how he introduces. So once the, all of this, you know, emotional roller coaster with the the super high songs and then the low ballads and then... And all of these seven words repeated 11 times in each of these anthems. Finally, it's time to, you know, the, the crowd's whipped into a frenzy there. Expectation, Jesus is in the house. Something's going to shift. God is about to do something. We're believing for you for a breakthrough and things like that. And now it's time for Russell Evans to come out and do business. The man of God, so to speak. And listen to how he was introduced. Here we go. This room, but all over the world, there's people sitting in churches, in their homes, watching with us tonight, and uh, we're just believing that this is just the beginning, just the beginning of something powerful that God is establishing through our ministry here in the U.S. It's not that we're coming to tell you what to do, but we're just coming to add to the landscape, and we believe God is wanting to use this as a catalyst. You know, tonight, it's a great privilege for me. You know, I've been involved with Planet Shakers since the beginning, For 15 years, I've sat in conferences and I've seen time and time again, conferences just like this start out and the first night, there's a little bit of, you know, wow, this is good and what's going on and people watch and then during the day, people get touched by God and, you know, tonight people watching online are just seeing something happen and it always just keeps building. But I want to tell you, it's every time, whether it's the first night or the last night, the middle night, when our founder... And our visionary leader come. Your what? Yeah, let me back that up. Listen again. Your what and your what? The last night, the middle night, when our founder and our visionary leader. Our founder and our visionary leader. I thought Christ was the head of the church and the founder of the church. This seems like, well an inappropriate non-biblical exaltation of a, quote, pastor who's supposed to be a shepherd and a servant. But he, again, listen to how he's introduced. It's every time, whether it's the first night or the last night, the middle night, when our founder and our visionary leader comes to the stage, oh, it just, mm, it just starts to go to a, a, another level. Oh, it goes to another level when your founder and visionary leader comes to the stage. 
And tonight, wherever you might be, in this room, all over the world, it's our incredible privilege. I know, because over 15 years it's been consistent, that tonight we're about to turn up the heat. God's about to do something. So God's about to do something because of their founder and visionary leader. He's finally here. Oh, I'm glad he came to save us. So with everything you got, I want you to join with me and welcome to the stage, the founder, the visionary leader, my great friend, pastor, Russell Evans! Serious. Have you ever been in a church service where somebody came out to whip the crowd up into a frenzy so that your pastor, when he takes the pulpit, people are woohoo! Oh, the founder and visionary leader is here. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? A founder and a visionary leader. So, um, yeah, let me, you know, and no sooner did he take the sa- stage that, well, things started to take a really bad twist, okay? Now I'm going to play for you some of the train wreck um, sound bites from him, but uh, listen to how Russell Evans, you know, tries to himself now piggyback on the MC's uh, job of creating the expectation that something's about to move, something's about to break through, because he, the visionary leader, is here, you know? Well, listen to this. If you love Jesus in this place, I want you to push your neighbor and say, get ready, neighbor. I'm ready to go absolutely crazy for the Word of God. So today, I'm ready, say I'm ready for a new level. I'm ready to receive my healing, to receive my breakthrough. And if you love Jesus... So I'm ready to receive my healing, to receive my breakthrough. This is nothing more than a... Snake oil salesman setting up shop, whooping people up into a frenzy so that he can sell them little jars of potion that, you know, will heal whatever ails them. Whether it's gout or, you know, maybe they'll have intestinal difficulties. Who I'm here. I'm ready to have a breakthrough because the visionary leader is here. Now, the founder and visionary leader is going to help me have a move of God. So I'm going to receive my breakthrough. Woohoo! Jesus, with everything you have, would you give him a praise like he deserves? Come on. And there. Ow! Ow. (laughs) Sounds like he's in pain there. They're microwaving the cat there in San Diego. Ow! 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 (laughs) What lunacy is this? Anyways, I'm going to play just a few more things for you as far as, you know, kind of samples of the buffoonery that Russell Evans engaged in when he was on the stage there. And, you know, for instance, making statements, well, like this. The church was birthed out of a prayer meeting. What are you birthing out of your prayer life? Oh, man. All these guys talking about the need for me to birth something. I'm a dude. I can't birth nothing. Hang on. Again, there's two statements kind of back to back. Listen to this. The church was birthed out of a prayer meeting. What are you birthing out of your prayer life? Yeah. A generation that doesn't seek the face of God is a generation that doesn't have a visitation of God. Uh huh. You got a Bible verse that says that? Let me back that up so you can hear it again. These are just some samples of crazy things that he said here. Generation that doesn't seek the face of God is a generation that doesn't have a visitation of God. Mm-hmm. No Bible verse that says that. Now, here's the funny thing. I told you the guy's kind of a mix between a seeker driven, vision casting leader, uh, the Patricia King gang, and a tele evangelist, okay? Uh, let me give you an example of something that sounds pretty much akin to what we'd expect from the Patricia King gang. Uh, here's Russell Evans talking about how God is like a drug. So you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Hey, man, take some drugs. Pop a pill. Get high. No, man, I don't need to take drugs to get high. You don't? No, dude. I've been to the most high. What, what, what do you mean most high? Oh, I just got in the presence of God. I opened up his word. 
and I snorted a few lines. Yeah, that's right. Let me back that up. You heard him say that, so uh, I don't need to get high. I've been in the, I've been with the Most High, so I open up my Bible and I snort words like they're cocaine. Yeah, listen. I open up His Word and I snorted a few lines. I fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. So now we got God, you know, the Bible is basically like cocaine lines on a mirror. You open it up and you snort it because God wants to give you a high. Now that was him trying to sound something like the Patricia King gang. And here's Russell Evans sounding a lot like a televangelist. Listen in. Now, shh, shh, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. Wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. Right now, God wants to heal some people in this room. There's someone's back being healed to my left. Someone's back is being healed right there. So now he's calling out healings at the end of the service. There is someone here right now. You have a knee injury and God's healing you right now. There is someone here who has incredible sinus problems. You're, you're over in that section at the back. God is healing you. So if, if you showed up there, you know, got, you're expecting your breakthrough. If you got a back problem or sinus infection or whatever, whoo, he's calling out healings right here. He's like a televangelist. This guy is like the perfect heretical hybrid. But Russell Evans' greatest skill, if you can call it that, is his ability, like a megachurch pastor, a seeker-driven megachurch pastor, to allegorize and completely miss the point of biblical passages. For instance, the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And what we're going to do now is we're going to listen to a portion of his teaching from Friday night to listen, you know, to listen to how he completely botches, mishandles, twists, and mangles, well, God's word. And so uh, this is the, the opening of his teaching regarding Elijah. And we'll skip around a little bit. You'll hear some of the lines that we heard earlier uh, just a minute ago, uh, in the bigger context of what he was teaching on Friday night out there at The Rock in San Diego. Here's Russell Evans. So Elijah says, okay, let's have a showdown. And so he says, we're going to prove which God is real, whether Baal's real or the God of Israel is real. And so he says, we're going to go up the mountain and we're going to set up an altar and you get your 450 prophets of Baal and there'll be just me. You know, some of us think we are outnumbered, but I've discovered me and God are always a majority. Because my Bible says, if God be for me, who can be against me? My Bible says that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. My Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So when God lives in you, you are a majority every time. So you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Hey, man, take some drugs, pop a pill, get high. No, man, I don't need to take drugs to get high. You don't? No, dude. I've been to the most high. What, what, what do you mean most high? Oh, I just got in the presence of God. I opened up his word. And I snorted a few lines. I fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, wow. But he repaired the altar that had been torn down. Then he took 12 stones. And then the Bible says he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. And he piled wood on the altar and he cut the bull into the pieces and he laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water. Wait wait, wait a second, fill it with water. They were in a drought. For three years, they were in a drought. Who's ever been in a drought before? Okay, now notice what he just did there. Okay, if you're familiar with the story from 1 Kings chapter 18, this is the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, then you know that in chapter 17 that we learn this little thing. Okay, here's what it says, starting at verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew 
nor reign these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The drought was God's punishment of of the northern kingdom for worshiping Baal. Okay, that's what's going on here. And the the basically the false god that they were worshiping, in some senses, practically dictates God's judgment. The reason being is that Baal is supposedly the god of the air, the god who brings the rain, the god who, if he's really God, if he's you know if Baal is really God, then then Yahweh wouldn't have the ability to keep Baal from bringing the rain. But he did. And not only that, the Lord made it clear that the rain would not come again until Elijah said so. Plain and simple. Okay, This is God's judgment of Baal. This is God's judgment of those people in Israel who were worshiping this false deity. And what we're listening to here, let me back this up just a little bit, um, from Russell Evans is a classic Bible-twisting technique. Just allegorize the drought without it giving any details as to why the drought was there. This wasn't a drought caused by, you know, just some strange thing that happened that a whole bunch of people suffered and nobody particularly knows why. No, the reason they were experiencing a drought because God was punishing Israel for their idolatry. And this was announced to the king of Israel himself prior to the onset of said drought. Okay, listen again. I can fill it with water. They were in a drought. For three years, they were in a drought. Who's ever been in a drought before? You can't turn your sprinklers on on the right day because you could get fine. When you're in a drought, there's no water. What's the most precious thing in a drought? It's water. When you come to give to the Lord, (laughs) he wants what's precious to you. You might be in a drought spiritually, will come and give what's precious to you to the Lord. Put it on the altar of sacrifice. (sighs) What kind of nonsense is this? So if you're experiencing a drought, God wants something precious from you in order to get rid of the drought. That's not what's going on in the story at all. This guy is basically uh, fleecing these people and shaking them down for money. You might be having a drought in relationships. Why don't you come and give your relationship to the Lord? What is precious to you? Put it on the altar. That sentence doesn't even make sense. Let me play it again. I mean, seriously, this is just spiritual gobbledygook. That sounds biblical because he quoted a Bible verse and then completely... uh, ignored what the passage really says. Why don't you come and give your relationship to the Lord? What is precious to you? Put it on the altar. And he poured on the altar. How many know that when when something's wet, it doesn't burn? (laughs) You see, I, I believe that the nations of the world, particularly the Western nations of the world, are in a spiritual drought. I, I, I think there's drought all around the place, but I know there's good... I completely agree, and you're actually one of the symptoms of the drought. You are a waterless cloud, which is what, how Scripture des- describes false teachers. Good news, because I can hear the sound of rain. See, when you talk about rain, you talk about blessing. When you talk about rain, you talk about outpouring. When you talk about rain, you talk about abundance. When you talk about rain, you talk about refreshing. When you talk about rain... You talk about heaven. But there was a drought. He pours water on. He says, God, okay, do your stuff. And fire comes down and the Bible says the whole nation bows its knee to the Lord and, he, and they begin to cry out, the Lord, yes, he is God. The Lord, he's, yes, he is God. And so the whole nation bows its knee to God again. Would there be somebody, maybe Elijah, maybe a, a young lady, maybe a young man that would say, God, I, here I am, use me. Here I am, I'm going to pour out what's precious to me to you, that you would turn a nation to say the Lord, he is God. This is complete biblical obfuscation. He should be brought up on charges here. I mean, this is, oh, 
This is a flat out rank twisting of God's word. And I love what just about happened. You see, what happens is a miracle comes and people stop at their miracle, but God just doesn't want you to stop at your miracle. He wants you to take your miracle to a whole new level. <laughs> what? This is a spiritual malpractice of the worst kind. Let me back this up again. Listen to this nonsense. And I love what just about happened. You see, what happens is a miracle comes and people stop at their miracle, but God just doesn't want you to stop at your miracle. He wants you to take your miracle to a whole new level. Hmm. See, yeah, what passage in 1 Kings 18 says that God, that people stop at their miracle, but God wants to take their miracle to a whole nother level, a whole new level? This doesn't say that at all. Hmm. See, the Bible says in Acts, the Holy Spirit was poured out. It wasn't just for the Christians to feel good. It was poured out so they could be empowered to make a difference in their world. They took the miracle. What passage in Acts says that the Holy Spirit was poured out so that Christians can make a difference in the world? I don't know of any passage in the book of Acts that says that. Not one. And multiplied the miracle. So now we're into miracle multiplication. And the Bible says in verse 41, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink. Now what this signifies to me is I, I, when I... Okay, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to read that portion of this text. Remember what I just read from 1 Kings chapter 17. This is the setup for the story. Let me read it again. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except for by my word. That's kind of the setup for then the drought, Elijah disappearing, heading out to a different territory, disappearing for three years, and the famine that just lays Israel waste for three years, and then it finally culminates with the showdown on Mount Carmel. God shows up, literally, he shows up, and it results in Israel saying, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God, Yahweh, he is God, and then they kill the prophets of Baal, right? That's what happened, okay? And now the story continues from there, chapter 18, verse 41, after the prophets of Baal are slaughtered, here's what it says. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. Okay, what does that signify? Now there's going to be rain, because remember, God told Elijah, you let him know there's not going to be any rain until you say it's going to rain. So now Elijah has just said, it's going to rain. Okay, again, showing that the that Yahweh, he's Lord. You know, Ahab is still resisting God, still persisting in unrepentant unbelief and is still an idolater. Do you think the fact that God showed up in power on Mount Carmel all of a sudden made Ahab a believer? Not even close, okay? So here, now to add insult to injury, Elijah says, hey, guess what? It's going to rain. You better get up. You better get somewhere quick because it's going to rain. So verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up on the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up and look toward the sea. And he said, and he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And then he said, go again, seven times. So the, the guy went back and forth seven times. Okay. And the seventh time he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black, the clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. That's the story. That's what the Bible says. This was not some miraculous increase. This was not some blessing at this point. This was to add insult to injury, if you would. Uh, Ahab, persisting in unrepentant idolatry, 
now at this point gets gets to hear, basically hear from the prophet Elijah, hey, guess what? It's going to rain now because because I've said so. And Yahweh is the one who told me to tell you it's not going to rain until I say so. And so now it's going to rain. You better hurry up. You're going to get caught in this. And sure enough, it rains. You think Ahab was excited about that? Probably not. <laughs> the text doesn't exactly say, but you can see what's going on here. Okay, so now let's find out what Russell Evans has to say about this particular text and how it's somehow an increase in multiplication of, of miracles and blessings. I eat and drink, it's about a, it's around a time of celebration. <laughs> We're about to go somewhere. See, I believe the church should be the place of celebration. He said, go and eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of the mountain. (laughs) Here we go. Climbs up. He's on the top of the mountain. You see, I discovered when God brings a breakthrough, go up higher because there's another breakthrough coming. And the Bible says he gets up. (laughs) Listen to this. Complete and utter nonsense. Top of the mountain. You see, I discovered when God brings a breakthrough, go up higher because there's another breakthrough coming. So, oh man. So Elijah goes up on top. So this means that, you know, if you've had a breakthrough, go up higher because another one's coming. This has nothing to do with breakthrough. And the Bible says he gets up on the top of the mountain and he begins to pray. <laughs> it's amazing me how many people don't pray anymore. They can put on programs, they can come and have a nice church service, but God never created the church for the consumer. He created it for the disciple. The church was birthed out of a prayer meeting. What are you birthing out of your prayer life? A generation that doesn't seek the face of God is a generation that doesn't have a visitation of God. Entertain me, do this for me, do that. No, God says, come on, come up higher. And begin to burst something. And he began to pray and he calls his servant over. He says, it hadn't rained for three years. He says, go and have a look for rain. So the servant goes for this run and it takes him a while to look. And and he goes and has a look and he looks out and and there's no rain. And he runs back and he's there and he's running. and, and, And Elijah says, he's there. And Elijah goes, any rain? No, he says, go again. All right, I'll go again. You're sitting there, sending me out to do all the work. No rain. Hope he doesn't send me again. Any rain? No, go again. Go again. It's all right for him to say. Just sitting and praying all day while I'm doing the work. No rain. If he asks me to go again, I don't know. I might go to another church. No rain, go again. I'm sick of going to this church. It challenges me to keep believing even when I see nothing. Notice what he's doing with the story. He's literally hijacked this entire story. He's not telling us anything about what's really going on in this text. If he asks me to go again, I'll tell him to go himself. What type of pastor is he? I don't want to go to his church anymore. He says there's a miracle coming, but where is it? He's just sitting down doing nothing. Notice that not only does this little monologue from the servant of Elijah not appear in Scripture, not at all, um, it's somehow placing the important uh, breakthrough that's supposedly going to take place in the hands of the servant rather than in the prophet whom God said it will not rain until he says it's going to rain. Unbelievable. Go again. Served in the house, planted in the house. See, so many people don't get this. The guy, the Bible doesn't say those that are planted in the houses of God will flourish. See, God never called you to be a pot plant. They would move here, move there, move there, move there. I've been offended. Welcome to the world. I've had hurt. Welcome to the world. The very first thing they do when you're born is they slap you. You are in this warm place and now you come out, bam, whack. 
So many people miss out on their destiny because they're like pot plants and go from here to here to here to here. Oh, that pastor offended me. Well, let me get you on the other side. When pastor puts into you. So you miss your destiny because you're like a pot plant. Is that what this text is saying? You And you leave and go somewhere else. How does that make us feel? We're human. Oh, the pastors are high-fiving me right now. They're going, preach that. <laughs> Woo, five times. Any, go again. Okay. Woo, I'm getting better at this. Just so you know, he's walking back and forth the length of the stage to demonstrate what this servant did because apparently the miracle was in his hands. Six songs. I hope he asked me to go again because I'm a really running junkie now. <laughs> go again. <laughs> Woo! You see, every time you go and look in faith, you get stronger on the inside, even if you don't see. Every time. Yeah, notice that this passage doesn't say anything about the servant becoming stronger in faith on the inside because of him going back and forth checking to see if, if there was rain coming time you go back and say i'm going to look again it doesn't seem like it's going to happen it doesn't look like it's going to happen the weather forecast says it's not going to happen but i'm going to keep looking for my miracle would there be a generation that would say i'm going to keep looking until the rain comes Mm -hmm. i'm going to keep looking for my miracle Uh uh-huh yeah um this text isn't about your miracle at all it's not teaching anything even remotely approaching that this is just flat out narcissistic eisegesis by a man who has shown himself to be a skilled heretical hybrid kind of a cross between somebody from the patricia king gang who gets high on the holy ghost a cross between the seeker driven visionary leader and, uh, and a televangelist who calls out miracles and the like. And this happened at one of the premier seeker-driven churches in the United States, The Rock in San Diego. Miles McPherson gave his glowing stamp of approval to Russell Evans uh, that Sunday morning, in fact, just a couple of days ago, and let him preach the Sunday morning services, every single one of them. But he didn't rightly handle God's word. He mangled it. This was emotional and spiritual manipulation of the highest degree. The guy clearly has no concept of what the Bible's about and knows how to manipulate people and whip them up into a frenzy to expect their miracle and their breakthrough and all that kind of stuff. And none of it, none of it, none of the things he said are actually taught in Scripture. This is a man who's literally well, gone crazy on what he thinks is his particular and unique purpose and vision from God. The reality is is that this Russell Evans' so-called vision is not from God. He's not a faithful proclaimer of Christ and Him crucified for our sins, and he doesn't rightly handle God's Word. And Scripture warns us, don't be deceived in any way. And all Russell Evans is, is a deceiver. All right, we're up on our second break. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com, or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash pirate Christian. Follow me on Twitter, my name there at pirate Christian. Sermon review on the other side of the break. Don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. We don't need to rethink Christianity. We need to rediscover it. You're listening to Fighting for the Faith. Pirate Christian Radio Theater presents Death of a Salesman. Are ye a salesman? Why, yes, I am. Can I interest you in some... You're listening to Byron Christian. 